by the book on BFM 89.9. Hello and welcome to By the Book. I am Sharmila Ganesan together with my co-host as always, Ali Trilin. Hello. Well, this was eventually going to come. It is Harry Potter's birthday season and both Lynn and I are self-admitted Harry Potter fans. Yes, Potterheads to the max. Um it is so his birthday falls on July 31st, which I'm not if I'm not mistaken is also the date of his author mom, uh JK Rowling. So, um and we thought it would be good just because excuses to talk about Harry Potter, but also because all the Harry Potter books start on July 31st. That's right because they always start on yeah exactly. on Harry's birthday pretty yeah. much you know yeah. uh, where he's eagerly awaiting birthday cake delivery by Al and you know all the rest of it so um yeah like I we're just going to be talking today about all things Potter the world of it um its significance yeah and i suppose now that we've got some distance from the books and the movies um also just what's happened in that time since and how we feel about the series after having extricated ourselves from that world so what was your relationship with harry potter as it was being published because i was one of those people who um would be the midnight lineups you know when there was a new book coming out and um it was a very big deal for me so i only got into the books um when the fourth book came out so i read all of the first second third and fourth in a stretch and then i realized that the fifth book was coming out i think about a year after that so definitely i did the whole midnight lineup thing uh, well no not midnight lineup i think i did a mid afternoon lineup <laughs> in kinokuniya uh, because they were offering discounts and you know those tomes were huge they were also expensive because it would be the hard cover at first yes definitely definitely i've lined up every year since then i'm going to read from sorcerer's stone and i'm going to read um now i absolutely loved writing this passage the last shop was narrow and shabby peeling gold letters over the door read olivanders makers of fine wands since 382 bc a single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window a tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside It was a tiny place except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon. said a soft voice harry jumped hagrid must have jumped too because there was a loud crunching noise and he got quickly off the spindly chair an old man was standing before them his wide pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop hello said harry awkwardly ah yes said the man yes yes i thought i'd be seeing you soon harry potter it wasn't a question you have your mother's eyes And what do you think about Harry Potter makes it such an appealing story because I have thought about this and part of it is definitely the writing mm-hmm. uh the fact that it's just it's well written you might not like her style you might not appreciate maybe everything that she does but it doesn't change the fact that fundamentally it's a well told story mm-hmm. um i think and also the world building is so very real that um it feels natural to talk about muggles and quidditch and you know, squibs and all the rest of it i think it's the details um yes which is a big part of the world building isn't it um just the fact that once you're in this world you can you can see the the corn as in Hogwarts that she's talking about you can taste the food that they're eating in the great hall you know what these characters look like you know what they sound like JK Rowling is great with details and um I realized this because uh when I was really lucky enough to go to the Harry Potter theme park in in Florida I realized that what had come out in front of me I had already had in my head 
Mm. And that was because she had already described them in the book so well. And it's not to do with the movies. It had to do with how incredibly good J.K. Rowling is with conjuring up this world with words. The characters are also really um, told with that same level of detail. Mm -hmm. And we get to grow up with them. We get to watch them grow. Um, And it is, I think, a big thing to kind of be a part of their lives and have them be a part of ours for such a significant period of time because it was probably the first one, uh, the first book series that caught me at the exact right age. Um, So if you think about things like the other sort of long-running series Mm -hmm. that come out um, that usually fall as we've as it's well established within the fantasy sci-fi realm, um, none of them have really been, I was the right age, you know, that perfect age of obsession where Mm -hmm. you first see it and you're like, oh, I need to know everything about this. Um, And for that reason, I think it's so formative for so many people because it is also one of the few that transcended all those different genre boundaries. I think part of it was also that um, a lot of these books where people grow up as they go along and the other one that I can think of that I was really invested in was Anne of Green Gables and she grows up along uh, that uh, along the series. They had already all come out. Yeah. So the books were already there. Whereas for me, in, in this case with Harry Potter, it stops and then you have to wait um, a couple of years and then the next book comes out. And so there's a real sense of it's like a best friend has moved and then you meet them again and then they go away again, but then you're waiting to see them again. It really is, there's a propulsive experience of moving forward, of of discovering something. And it almost feels like she's writing them just for you, that they're not already out in the world, that, that she's creating a gift for you. With that said, this is a gift that contains real trauma. I don't think we should talk about Harry Potter without addressing um, the very basic fact that Post book four, or even within book four, things start to go down, you know. Um, It gets very real. There is a lot, even though this is a book that in the first place begins um, with the central character being orphaned. Yes. um, And that in and of itself is a huge thing. But as time goes on, um, not to get into spoiler territory, just in case, but there's a lot of loss that's experienced throughout the books, uh, and that happens to other characters, not just Harry. Mm -hmm. And halfway through, really, pretty much halfway through the series, you start to wonder what you're reading. (laughs) Because it really moves very far beyond um, a book that's for kids or even tweens. I honestly have wondered, because I know J.K. Rowling has said she knew where the series was going when she started writing it. But sometimes I wonder whether she actually knew, knew, you know? Because it starts off on a very... um, definite children's book territory and as it progresses it it really goes to some very dark places you know characters die and and there are these there are, there are explorations of what it means to go through things like um intense bullying or or, or you know almost a, a society that lives in a caste system you know racism and i don't know whether she realized that it was going to get that dark or that deep. I'm glad it did because it definitely added to what the story was. Uh, but it's 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 a series that I think almost grows on its own as, as the story goes along. And I'm glad. I'm glad that she didn't feel that she needed to contain herself to a children's book um, parameter. And it also starts to address things that J.K. Rowling herself would be complaining about. So for example, there is a character, Rita Skeeter, who is a tabloid journalist <laughs> of just the highest order, right? Um, and it that came out at a, around the same time that Hugh Grant was, you know, chucking baked beans at paparazzos <laughs> and then also launching um, this whole idea of whether or not phones were being tapped. You know, the phone tapping scandal was big at that point in time. And it made its way into Harry Potterverse. And that was also a really interesting thing to observe, which I suppose comes as a benefit of, again, growing up with it, because you start off as a kid and appreciate it as a kid. And then when you're maybe 16, 17, 18, and you're more aware of um, world news and you see it making its way into the book. That's also an interesting experience. Yes, definitely. Especially when she comes to the, I think it was book five, where you get a lot more of a sense of what the Ministry of Magic is Mm. and how they work. And uh, sort of this idea of uh, surveillance and, and the politics of this world that they live in. And it started feeling very much like the world that we lived in. And I think that was very clever. And again, something that couldn't have been done with book one or book two, but could have been done by the time we got to book five. 
partly because you no longer have to do so much world building. The yes. world is built. Yeah. Now you can just live in it. So do you have a favourite book of the seven? Is that a difficult question? That is a very <laughs> difficult question. I will need to think on that. I do know my least favourite. I can tell you that. Okay. Uh, my least favourite is um, book five, Order of the Phoenix. Yes, actually, that's my least favourite as well. Um, and I... It's a weird thing because I like a lot of what happens in that book, but it feels almost like a filler book. Uh, yes, and also um, I think by that point, because you are so um, you are so accustomed to multifaceted characters, mm -hmm. that having your central guide through this world, Harry, uh, be constantly angry, yes. despite the fact that that is probably a very real reflection of how um, a character like Harry would be reacting, it's still made for a very exhausting book experience. Um, <laughs> every year or every other year, I read Harry Potter from start to finish. doesn't take me long because um, they're actually very easy to read yes, despite their length. Are. And every year I get to book five and I think, am I gonna? And then I do it. <laughs> but my fondness for it has not grown, I have to say. My frustration with it has lessened, mm -hmm. but I haven't grown fonder. My favourite book um, actually is Prisoner of Azkaban. Who is that? That man? He's a murderer. Sirius Black has escaped from Azkaban prison. Sirius Black is the reason the Potters are dead. I think it's because that's the book that sets the tone for all of the other great books that come. Because the first two are not my favourite. Um, they're, they're fine. They're fine. They're all right, right? Uh, but Prisoner of Azkaban is really that turning point where things get real. Um, and it sets... Uh, it sort of sets out the path for a lot of other things that happen in books that I've really liked later. I love Half-Blood Prince. Me too. I really like Deathly Hallows, even though it it's, can be problematic in some places. And I and for me, Prisoner of Azkaban was the definitive, you know, the idea of introducing us to the Patronus, um, learning about Harry's parents, and that scene where he sees the the stag Patronus across the water, it gets to me still. Every time I think of it, I choke up a little bit because that's the first time you understand what it means to grow up without parents. Yes, and also that's the first time we are introduced to Sirius Black. Absolutely. And Remus Lupin. Yes. And uh, just the idea that not to go back to your point about having lost your parents, it's one thing to not have them in your life. It's another thing to also never have heard the stories of their youth yes. because nobody told you. Mm -hmm. um, and because there was some great war that happened before you were born um, or while you were born and you and everybody who could have told you about your parents have died. And so that's what I mean about Harry and the trauma. You know, yeah. it's a tough one. We do need to take a break though, but we will continue this conversation about all things Harry Potter because, well, it's Harry Potter's birthday week and we'll maybe try and see if we can get Lynn to tell us which book is her favourite. You're listening to Buy the Book on BFM 89.9. Best flipping moments. BFM 89.9, The Business Station. Welcome back. You're listening to Buy the Book with me, Sharmila, and with Lynn. Uh, we are talking about Harry Potter because July 31st is Harry Potter's birthday. And well, Lynn and I just love Harry Potter and needed an excuse to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we did not manufacture the birthday. Um, he would be 39 this year. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so that's just, let, let's just sit with that for a bit. Harry Potter's older than I am? Harry Potter, yes. I did not know this. Yes. When we talk about growing up with Harry Potter, it turns out in, you know, real life terms, if you read Harry Potter and the Cursed Child and you know about Harry's entire life with the ministry, yes. at this point, he's 39. All right. I'll let that sit for a while. Yeah. As, as are Ron and Hermione. I cannot. No. Okay. No. <laughs> World is changing right now. I can't deal with this. <laughs> so um, we were talking earlier about uh, just a bunch of things, right? What we liked about the books, um, the fact that there's a real underlying darkness to it, which I think makes the entire series that much richer. Uh, we also heard our least favourite book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same one. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Yes. And so I am going to... Okay, firstly, I agree with your choice of Prisoner of Azkaban because um, although we're not talking about the films, uh, that's a separate conversation, it is also the best film, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince is probably thereabouts mm -hmm. for me uh, because it does that same thing of uh, maturing out of... A, not my favourite book. So it goes from 
uh, to great again. Yeah. So it manages to graduate us into that new space. Uh, it also contains several game-changing moments um, and it contains a lot of game changes not just for Harry but for the world in which the world he occupies. Mm -hmm. um, it makes the stakes for all of Hogwarts very real while at the same time returning him to not being jealous about his friends being prefects anymore and just <laughs> understanding that there's more to it than that. So yes, I, I would say that um, The Half-Blood Prince and the way it deepens, for example, Severus Snape's story is yes. just a very important book. Times like these, dark times, it can bring people together. Take my hand. And they can tear them apart. You're the chosen one, Harry. You have to realize who you are. Without you, we leave the fate of our world to chance. You have no choice. Harry, no! You must not fail. It's over. I think Half Blood Prince is of the later books the best. And it's primarily because Snape has been such a staple in the in the series from the first book, but it's really only in this book that you start seeing him as not just multifaceted, but as someone who could have had his own series. Yes. There's so much um, that we didn't know about him and then suddenly it's all dropped onto you and she does it in this way that's not a cheap reveal. It's not a like, ha, you didn't know this all along, but it feels so organic and, and it's brilliant. And I, I think that takes a lot of skill. And one of the things that I don't think Rowling gets enough credit for as a writer is her ability to let things unfold Sometimes that manifests as writing pages and pages of things that feel long. Yeah. But I think there's also a real um, ability to tell a story and let it take its time and then tell you something at the right time. And that's present throughout the series. So before we move on to um, the Harry Potter universe at large, you know, post the books... What's, who is your favourite character? Do you I, have one? You know, I knew you were going to ask me this. Well, you sprung the <laughs> I book know, one. I know, I did, I did. So in all fairness, now I have to think of one. Um, I always struggle because my, I have so many favourites. I think I'm going to say Snape. Because when I went to the Harry Potter world and I had to figure out whose wand, I'm confessing to a lot of geekery, I know, whose wand I wanted to buy. I have Sirius Blacks. Yeah, very, very <laughs> close. And I picked Snape because I thought... I wanted the wand of the person for whom this wasn't the easiest journey and who made a lot of sacrifices. Yeah, yeah. I get that. That's a strong choice. Um, my knee-jerk reaction is always Hermione because obviously she is my avatar in Harry Potter, you know, the, <laughs> the nerdy yep. book girl. Um, but I also have and will always have a soft spot for Sirius Black. The, the world isn't split into good people and death eaters. We've all got both light and dark inside us. What matters is the part we choose to act on. That's who we really are. Again, somebody who did not have the easiest path and who also first dropped upon you um, a sense of real trauma and grief and struggle in what was supposed to be a kid's book. Yes. Because, because if you think really, sometimes when I think about the things that Sirius Black went through, um, and how he was maligned, and how um, and how his life turned out, I am overcome with sadness. You know, <laughs> and, and and that's a strange thing to say about a book character. I understand that, but it is that feeling. And so, just in terms of who I feel the most for, despite the fact that I love everyone, um, even the Malfoys, uh, I will say that. Yeah, Sirius Black. Yes, I think we often forget, don't we, that, um, and it was in Prisoner of Azkaban that he was introduced, that this is a man who spent his, a lot of his life in a hardcore prison where they were tortured and for the crime of murdering his best friends. Yes. Which he didn't do. It's you're reading this and you're thinking, what am I reading? Is, yes. is this a kid's book that I'm reading? Like, what world is this? And that point about what world is this um, is related, I guess, to the fact that we are also dealing with um, a world that can't let Harry Potter go as much as we can't mm -hmm. seem to. Um, it 
continues to want to A, make money off of it, because why not? But also, there are texts and films and plays that are expanding the world both sideways and beyond, right? So it's looking at what happens after the books. Some are happening, uh, some are occurring before the, yes. the stories of the books take place. And we are widening this world in a way that I think sometimes feels good and sometimes feels a little bit um, off-putting. I'm not entirely sure how comfortable I am with a lot of it. Some of it is fine. Some of it I'm able to actually ignore simply because I feel like I'd rather just stick to the seven books and maybe the adjacent, you know, Quidditch ones and the Fantastic <laughs> Beasts ones. Um, and then sometimes I feel, well, no, but this does add value to the 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 world that I love. So that's tough and I and I almost feel like now looking back some of that attachment and love that I had for the series has been affected by um well let's face it JK Rowling's constant tinkering with with the with the original story that she wrote. I understand that. I have tended to ignore that entirely. Um I think it helped that I didn't uh, engage much with Pottermore while the Potter books were still a very big thing in my life, you know. Um, so whenever she reveals new chapters or whatever, um, or extra notes, and it's all posited as fan service, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily anything that the fans asked for sometimes. Um, I'm able to just brush past it. So the revelations that have come out regarding um, Albus Dumbledore and his sexuality and just the rest of it, I'm able to just move past it. Um, in the case of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them uh, and that film series mm -hmm. and the scripts that come out because of it, what I'm plucking from that are the themes of Harry Potter and not actual developments. So I don't care about no magis mm -hmm. and um, Grindelwald is like, sure. But um, the theme of outsiders, the theme of people seeking love, you know, and how love can really... I'm, I'm going to say love can really overcome. I hear it already, but I will just say it anyway. Um, yeah, that, that whole theme that runs through all of Harry Potter, that's the stuff that I pluck out and that's the stuff that enriches my reading. So I'm, I've been able to keep my own love of the books relatively secure. You know what I love about the Harry Potter books is being able to say things like love can overcome. Um <laughs> You know, because as you grow up and you become an adult, it becomes unfashionable and sort of cliche to believe in these things. And to believe that your best friends will always come through for you. Yes. Just... I'm Ron, by the way. Ron Weasley. I'm Harry. Harry Potter. So, so it's true. I mean, do you really have the... The, the what? The scar. Oh. Wicked. <sighs> Holy cricket, you're Harry Potter. I'm Hermione Granger. And you are? Um, Ron Weasley. Pleasure. I love that there was, that there is this series that appealed to me as I was just getting into college that I can still read today. And it lets me feel like it's all right to be that person. It's all right to be that person who thinks... Love can overcome. Yes. Um, and it's it's been... Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, it's the kind of thing that perhaps because you grew up with Harry Potter, you feel it's almost not cheesy or it's acceptable, yes. acceptably cheesy to or say. Or in certain circles, like in a studio with a fellow co-host. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a safe space. <laughs> but okay, both of us are fans. So it's a biased question, right? Um, are the Harry Potter books good? I think the series as a whole is a success in terms of telling the story that it wants to tell. So, um, like I said, right at the start, it's a story well told. Um, I firmly believe that. It's not a story evenly told. So, are the Harry Potter books good? I think some of them are very good. Mm -hmm. And some of them are just part of a story well told and a successful series. But if you look at them in isolation... Um, Nah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always have trouble answering this question, especially by people who don't like the series. Yes, of which there are many for yeah. some reason. Um, my thing is always, you could not possibly have won over the hearts and minds of the millions and millions of people without there having been some merit to it. Yes, 
the voice of the popular may not always be quality. <laughs> um, however, when you talk about children, when you talk about young people, they're not as easily... It, it's going to sound weird. They're not as easily lied to. If it's rubbish, if it's insincere, I don't think that they would have stuck around for seven books. That point about sincerity is important because I think um, when we talk about it and we probably, I mean, listening to the show, if we do it in the future, it's going to sound incredibly earnest. That, it that's, is. That's going to be, I think, the overriding <laughs> tone. But that's because the books themselves are relentlessly earnest. You know, um, they never give in to cynicism. And because of that, it's hard for me to take a cynical, adult, critical view of it. it it's, it's incredibly difficult. Happiness can be found even in the darkest of times. If one only remembers to turn on the light. Well, on that note, we unfortunately have to stop talking about Harry Potter for the moment. But do tell us what you think. Were you a fan of the books? Were you not? Um, you what's can... your favourite? Yes, what's your favourite book? Is it as difficult as it was for <laughs> us to decide? You can uh, email us at buythebook at bfm.my. You can also tweet us at BFM Radio or WhatsApp us at 018-789-8899. We have been talking about uh, the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling because July 31st is Harry's birthday. <laughs> And now we come to footnotes. Uh, and it's pretty big news last week when the Man Booker's long list was announced. They call it the Booker's Dozen, so it's 13 books, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it is, I mean... I know that the booker is in and of itself a big prize, right? It's it's one that whether shortlisted, longlisted, people like to just have it above the title yes. on their cover. Um, but this year is like heavy hitters to end all heavy hitters. There are a lot of big names in there. It really is quite a list. I mean, just going down this, this long list, there's Margaret Atwood, the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which I don't know, people have been waiting for for decades. There's Salman Rushdie with his version of uh, Don Quixote. Very exciting. Yes. That feels to me like a perfect marriage of author and subject, you know? He's been doing these sort of, you know, he did Arabian Nights recently um, and now he's doing Kishot. I think that's how it's pronounced, this book. Um, who else? There's Elif Shafak. Um, there's Jeanette Winterson. Yes. Um, when I saw that Jeanette Winterson was there, because I didn't know that this book, which is uh, which has a great title, Frankistine, mm -hmm. um, I did not realise that Jeanette Winterson had a new book out. And uh, Jeanette Winterson is one of those authors where I, I go long years without reading her. And then when I do, I'm always surprised at why I don't read Jeanette Winterson just all the time. Because she writes... Um, with this like beautiful precision um, and yeah just super excited I've actually never read Jeanette Winterson this might be the book to start with maybe maybe yes. I mean she's she's a lovely writer um, I love the title <laughs> I am excited also to have seen well okay before we get to what I'm actually excited to have seen I did just want to give a, sp a little shout out to Lucy Elman um, because Lucy Elman uh, was picked for Duck's Newburyport, which I'm just going to re read the description. A 1,000-page monologue from an Ohio homemaker composed almost entirely of a single sentence. What even is that, right? <laughs> and, and yet, I mean, a, a part of me wants to read it just so I say that I've read it. Yes. You know, um, the hope is with, with these... With these prizes, I think the hope is always that it's good. You never know. You're mm -hmm. never 100% sure. Um, and sometimes it, it does feel, and I think we've talked about this before, that uh, award winners, it, it's like the Academy Awards, where you win partly because of the pain. Yes. Um, and this, I don't know if it's that. I, I don't know if it's, you know, there because of its artistry, because of its experimentation. I mean, the judges say it was brilliantly conceived and challenges the reader with virtuosity and originality. And I'm like, hmm. Interesting. Well, also, Lucy Elman is the only American on the on the long list. Uh, you know, ever since they opened up the prize to authors from everywhere, really. Um, the big worry was that it would be dominated by Americans. But interestingly, this year, she's the only American author that made it. And for what looks to be a highly experimental work as well. Yeah. So, um, and 
the thing is, right, when we were talking about the heavy hitters, um, you know, and we mentioned specifically Margaret Atwood, uh, Margaret Atwood, Salman Rushdie, these are authors who are known for big works. Yes. You know, they're known for kind of uh, genre changes, uh, very big, meaty opuses. Um, and so it's nice to see, I think, a variety of lengths mm-hmm. <laughs> being, being um, represented here. I wanted to also say, um, I don't know if you've read Chigozi Obioma? I have not. Uh, so I recently read his book, The Fisherman, which tells the story of um, a, a Nigerian family with a strict brother, uh, with a strict father, um, and of three brothers, who, and how their lives just completely fall apart because of a prophecy um, made by essentially a witch, um, or, or you know, a, a crazed woman, a witch, somebody that they've been told to avoid in their village, and. Because of that prophecy of one brother will kill another brother, um, it drives one of the brothers, the eldest one, to kind of embark on this journey of uh, separating himself from his family, of isolating himself. And then the rest of the story is this almost mythical, incredibly sad, yet personal drama of how that prophecy plays out. And at the end of it, I didn't know what to do with myself. And to see (laughs) that um, he has a book here, An Orchestra of Minorities, Loosely based on the Odyssey. Oh yes. yeah, um, yeah. That and and to have, I'm curious about how that mythical quality is going to be translated into this new book. I'm very excited to read that. So speaking of heavy hitters, there really is only one um, debut author in the whole list, which should tell you how you know, use the word weighty. Um, but yeah, it, it is sort of a big list this year. And that new writer that just made it through was a Nigerian British author named Oyinkan Braithwaite for a book called My Sister the serial killer, which already is the one that I really want to read. Um, it's about um, a character that calls that's called on to help her murderous little sister <laughs> to clear up a mess. <laughs> I feel like, um, for lack of a better phrase, this that kind of title has cojones. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yes. like, my sister, the serial killer, you have a... Con- <laughs> and, and that's a debut, for goodness sake. I mean, that's a confident title. Yes. That's a sharp way to come out. Um I I have sometimes um, looked at, and we were talking about this, um, looked at the long list, the short list, um, sometimes even the eventual Booker Prize winner and thought, I will read this because um, I feel like almost like I must. It's I the should. right thing to do. It's, yeah, it's the right <laughs> thing to do. Man, they gave it the Booker, mm-hmm. sure. Um, but this year, I feel as if... Um, Maybe all 13 or at least, you know, something like 10, 11 of the books are books that I would naturally by myself be inclined to, you know, gravitate towards in a bookshop anyway. And I'm really enjoying the diversity. No, I agree. And uh, let us know, do you think you'll be reading some of the or all of the uh, long listed book nominees this year? Um, email us at bythebook at bfm.my. You can tweet us at BFM Radio. You can also WhatsApp us at 018-789-8899. That's all from Sharmila and Lynn. You've been listening to By the Book, BFM 89.9.